So let's give it another minute and then we'll get started. Abia and Alex, just for time check. So I'll message speakers with one minute in advance. Uh, and then at seven minutes, I'll also do one more message. Does that sound good or is that too many messages? <laughs> to the speakers, I yeah, I have no skin in the game. Okay, okay. Well, I'll just send a personal message to the speakers in Zoom. So you'll see a message from Jessica Jones with a, one minute. Thanks. Okay, so we're two minutes after the hour, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome everyone. This is um, City Forum. It's the bi-weekly seminar series in the Graduate Program in Community Regional Planning at the University of Texas um, at Austin. And usually I kind of run the show, but we've got a, a special City Forum this week um, that is going to be kind of uh, run by some of the folks who put together um, Planning Forum this year. Um, and so I'm just going to turn over the reins to um, Abhi Abakai, uh, one of our PhD students um, in community regional planning to um, introduce uh, the session today. So thanks everybody for coming. Great, thank you, Dr. Karner. Uh, just wanted to share my screen here. Sorry. Yes. Okay. It's loading. All right. And everyone can see the screen. Awesome. So uh, thank you so much for joining. Um, like Dr. Connor said, I'm a PhD student uh, in the CRP program and um, a bunch of us PhD students wanted to sort of re, uh, you know, uh, republish or start publishing again the planning forum journal, which is a student led journal here. So I'm just going to briefly sort of talk about our process for this volume, which is volume 18, which is released in the summer. Um, and and just wanted to sort of also uh, encourage you all to maybe if you're interested in taking this forward um, in the next year. Mm -hmm. So planning forum is an annual publication, um, ideally. Um, it is produced by graduate students, um, masters and doctoral students in the CRP department at UT. Uh, we publish peer reviewed scholarly articles as well as critical explorations in less conventional formats. and. It serves primarily as a platform for emerging voices and new perspectives. So if you're a junior scholar, um, if you're even if you're a master's student, a, a PhD student, you're trying to get your hand into the game of publishing, uh, this is a great platform to start. Uh, so we encourage that, that kind of work primarily. And it's open to scholars, practitioners, activists, writers of all kinds. And this year we published our 18th volume and we, the first one was published in the spring of 1995. So we've had a few jumps uh, in between. Mm -hmm. So the types of articles and submissions, we've got inquiries, which are the peer reviewed research uh, uh, articles. They're double blind peer reviewed. That means the authors don't know who is reviewing them and the reviewers don't know which authors they're reviewing. And then we've got explorations, which is critical, theoretical, exploratory essays or personal or journalistic accounts, interviews, conversations. So it could be very like it could be really a wide array of things, um, just sort of commenting on different aspects of planning. And then we've got photo essays, which is a sort of a more visual uh, part of the series, part of the uh, publishing process. So it can be a series montage or a collage of photographic images with captions and comments. This year, we didn't have book reviews, but that's also something we've done in the past where we do brief summaries and analysis, analysis of new books in the planning field. So the 2020-2021 process and board, you know, I really wanted to thank all the people that were involved. So me and Hai Jing, 
who's also a fellow PhD student from my cohort, uh, you know, we sort of uh, wanted to spearhead this, um, but it wouldn't have been possible without the editorial board um, that had Adam Oguski, Jessica Jones, who's our master's sort of representative, and we would love to have more people who are master's student involved, uh, Gianni, Mashrur, Rashmi, Yang, and Biafu. Um, and our designer, a, a special shout out to him. He isn't on this call today, but Hayden Hood, who's, who's an architect, uh, architecture student, did a fantastic job in not only designing the new volume, but also creating a new platform website for our journal to be uploaded to. And then a special shout out to the faculty advisors as well, Dr. Mueller, Dr. Wegman, and Dr. Rosenblum for uh, supporting us throughout this. Um, so the new volume process and release, and this is, I'm sort of giving this information so that if you're interested in the process, you'll know exactly what goes into it. Um, we had a call for abstracts in the summer of 2020. We received 29 abstracts, um, we would, for which we went through an internal review process and out of which we selected 18 abstracts. And this was based on, you know, whether it makes the methodology made sense, the, the did, did it contribute to the field, so it was sort of a, a board-wide uh, decision. And then we had a preliminary, preliminary matching process. We wanted to make sure that we were sending them to the right reviewers. So we um, tried to match reviewers to the kind of articles that were being um, contributed. We received then after that, um, when we gave back the, you know, whose abstracts were selected, we received 10 inquiry pieces, five explorations, and one photo essay in the fall of 2020, the inquiries articles specifically were sent to peer review. So that was a really robust process where each article had two external peer reviewers. Um, and there was a back and forth in terms of they would send their initial comments and then the authors would work on it. And then there would be another round of comments. Uh, and it went on for like three, four rounds. Um, and then there were the internal reviewed explorations and photo essays. We went through review and edits in spring. We were also renewing the website and designing the new volume with Hayden in the spring. And this is not something you'll have to do, the renewing website part, hopefully. Um, and we selected four inquiries and three explorations for our final uh, publication. And, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, hold on. I accidentally clicked on admit in the on the top. So yeah. Hey, Abia, you're uh, muted, just to heads up. Yeah, okay, here we are. Thank you so much. Um, so, thank you for your patience. Anyway, so we did um, uh, the four inquiries and explorations, but it's also included a couple of people who couldn't actually um, submit the full um, document in the end. But that that is also something that happens sometimes that the uh, authors cannot always come through to writing the entire piece. And we were able to publish the volume in the summer of 2021. So this past summer. Um, so I really encourage you all to check out the new website. Um, it's the sites uh, at .utexas site um, forward slash planning forum. Um, it has all of the previous volumes also uh, put out there. So you can check out the work that's been happening. Um, uh, you know, for all these past years, and our latest volume is up there too. Um, and the articles are available on the website as well. And you can even download the volume um, as a PDF form and share it with whoever you'd like to. We're also hoping to have print copies of the volume, which hopefully we'll have in the graduate office of, of um, CRP or the School of Architecture. Um, but once we do have that, we'll let, definitely send, a sh send an email regarding that so that you can keep an out look out for that. Um, so now I'd like to actually go on to the presentations by our authors. Uh, five, of the, five of the authors from our seven con contributions, you know, decided that they wanted to participate and I'm really, really grateful to them. 
So, um, uh, and I think Hai Jing will be presenting our first author. Thank you, Abia. Uh, so our first presenting author will be Gideon Azungri, who recently completed a Master of Science degree in urban planning and policy design at the School of Architecture, Urban Planning, Construction Engineering in Polytechnico di Milano. He is currently a PhD researcher in the Department of Geography at Concordia University. He also holds a Master of Philosophy degree in Planning and a Bachelor of Science degree in Development Planning from Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana. His academic and research interests are transdisciplinary in nature and sits at this intersection of informal urbanism, sustainability and resilience. So let's welcome Gideon to pre start his presentation. Thank you very much, Hygiene. Um, so I think I'll just jump right into it since we have very little time to present. Um, so the, my brief talk is going to be on the topic, deciphering the drivers of informal urbanization by Ghana's Evan Poor through the lens of the push-pull theory. So this work was actually a collaborative effort by myself and colleagues from Ghana, Richard Azarajek and Paul Puaire. So for this presentation, I'm going to briefly emphasize some of the major elements of our research and for us to gain a, a bit of an overview of the process we went through. So I'll start by giving a bit of a background of slums and informal urbanization, then talk about the geographical scope, why we decided to focus on Ghana. I'll talk a little bit about the method, then I'll emphasize the key findings of our research. So for the entire research, two main concepts were actually used, that is slums and informal urbanization. So for, for slums, this is a somewhat common term that according to the UN Habitat, these are communities or settlements that lack in crucial basic services, such as water, sanitation, durable housing, security of tenor, amongst others. And statistically, the number of households in such communities have been increasing. And currently it's around a little bit over 1 billion globally. Now we decided to adopt the terminology informal urbanization in our research process to emphasize this slum formation process. And so this term has actually been used sometimes interchangeably with unplanned urbanization or unauthorized urbanization. But uh, I would like to emphasize that informal urbanization in general transcends just the poor. And so sometimes it touches the upper class or the elites. But for our research, we decided to focus just on the urban poor because they are the direct, uh, directly affected by this process or these activities. Um, due to the current scale and future contours of uh, this phenomenon, the slum phenomenon, it has garnered a bit of global and academic attention. And I wanted to just mention a few of these, which is, I think, very uh, known worldwide. So for instance, the Sustainable Development Goals, particularly Goal 11, uh, emphasizes the need to improve slum livelihoods. But in our readings of the literature, we identified a bit of a gap in the way urban problems are analyzed in our view. So following Boateng, we, we realized that uh, a lot of the problems in the global south, and particularly in Africa, have followed the long-held pathological, indeed, Malthusian view. And what does this view say? Uh, generally, it says that urbanization is the prime or the sometimes the sole cause of a lot of our urban problems. And this view ascribes a lot of agency on the individuals. And so when we take issues of transportation, of water access, of housing, a lot of these assessments uh, implicitly suggest that is the individuals that are creating the situation we have. And we see it as a population heavy assessment. And so for our study, we decided to move away from this uh, rigid view to adopt a historical institutional framework to be able to understand how informal urbanization uh, uh, emanates in Ghana. We also adopted a push-pull theory to be able to assess how individually some of these factors are pushing or pulling individuals into this process and their subsequent uh, situation in slums. So we perform our analysis by focusing on Ghana. And for those who may not know Ghana, it's a West African country and population wise is about 30 million. Uh, we focus mainly on the Southern Ghanaian cities because that's where a lot of this informal urbanization process is happening. Now, for, we decided to focus on Ghana basically for three main reasons. The first is our familiarity with the context. 
and the ability for us to inculcate our tacit knowledge in the analysis and assessments. The second reason is actually that about 40% of urban dwellers in Ghana are living in slum settlements. And so this informal urbanization process is very, very predominant. And the last reason uh, talks about the, the fact that neoliberalism and austerity urbanism is affecting urban development policy and planning. And so this is actually a good case for us to understand how the historical and institutional factors are affecting informal urbanization. Um, methodologically, quite simply, we adopted a systematical literature review. And so we retrieved secondary data uh, based on themes and we analyzed them to be able to understand how some of these factors are pushing or pulling households to this informal urbanization process. So all in all, we retrieved about 70 studies. Some of them were reports, some of them were institutional documents to be able to uh, explain how these factors are, are working in the Ghanaian context. So just to the main findings, actually we had three, okay. We had three main findings. Um, the first is more related to the nature of housing policies we drastically changed from the 1980s. And so pre-1980, housing policies actually in Ghana were more interventionist and they were directed at low income housing production. But after the macroeconomic crisis and the need for structural changes in 1983, the government decided to completely withdraw from direct housing production for low income households in particular. And this has created huge housing deficits, leaving the urban poor with very limited housing options. And so they are forced to then squat on land because there is no other option for affordable housing. And the second factor that we also identified is that informal economic activities are also creating and uh, promoting this process of informal urbanization. And so the first is that slums are actually hubs of informal economic activities. And just to give one example is that in Ghana, one of the main informal economic activity is e-waste uh, processing. And so the largest e-waste dump site in the world is actually in one of these slums in Ghana. And so these uh, informal economic activities are attracting, that is they are pulling households to them. The last factor has to do with the weak urban governance. And for this, I want to emphasize one very critical and contextual factor, that is the customary institutions in Ghana. And so actually in Ghana, 80% of lands are owned by these customary institutions. And instead of just the ownership functions that they are performing, they are actually performing administrative functions. And this is actually running contrary to a lot of zoning and land use plans. So I think I'll just conclude now by saying that actually the main purpose of our research was just to shed light on the fact that our assessment of urban problems in the global south and in African cities should move away from looking at population heavy approaches to more historical institution, institutional drivers because to be able to address this problems in this situation, we need to understand how the institutions are also playing the roles and are conditioning some of the actions of the individuals. I think I'll end here where it looks like my time is up. Thank you, Gideon. Um, I uh, wanted to, before we go into questions, just wanted to give you a little bit of a format of how we're doing this. So each author is presenting and then um, we'll have a few minutes for questions and then we will have a chunk of time in the end for more detailed questions if that if we're not able to um, go through those. And also one of the themes that in our volume you might have noticed was that international planning uh, theme because a lot of our contributors had really cool research from around the world. So yes, Jessica, you had a question. Thank you, Gideon, for your contribution to our journal. Um, I had a question about the role of central business districts and whether you saw in your review and research if they play a role, an active role in providing housing or shaping housing. Thank you very much. And so, yes, we, we found issues of central business district and how they are affecting this process of housing, because basically what we understood from our assessments was that a lot of these central business districts and cities uh, are affecting the way and manner in which the urban poor can also play a role in accessing housing. And so what we saw was that in major cities in Ghana, particularly the southern cities, where informal urbanization is very ripe, these are where a lot of economic activities are present. And so this urban poor will also want to play a role and access these economic activities. And that is what is pulling them to these cities and central business districts. But the issue is that they are not able to 
gain affordable housing. And so the only option they have is to either squat or to go through this custom or traditional processes that I was explaining. And so this informal urbanization is going to keep happening if we don't find a way to actually house this urban poor within cities because they also want to exert their right to the city and also contribute to city development. Thank you. Um, any other questions at this time? Okay, um, so I'll, we'll move on to the next speaker and then we'll have some time in the end. So next is Evan. Uh, so Evan Todd is one of our alumni. He is currently employed as an urban designer and associate planner at Ayer St. Cross Architects in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, he's an academic research applied participatory and community-based design practice across the Americas. Prior to his studies, Evan worked as a community planner at the BC Workshop, a nonprofit community design center, as well as an urban designer at the city of Dallas. His design approach strives to amplify historically excluded voices in the planning process in order to realize design justice in under-resourced communities. So Evan, the floor is yours. Great, thanks so much. Um, is somebody controlling the slides for, okay, perfect. So thanks everybody uh, for joining this afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to talk about my um, article for planning forum this year. Um, and so I think we'll just dive into it since we're, we're short on time. So similarly to uh, Gideon's uh, focus, I'm really working in um, a self-built community in Columbia. So the study that I worked on was located in the historic central stairway of a community called Las Independencias in the Western district of San Javier in Medellin, Colombia. Um, so historically that central stairway was really um, the sort of invisible border between a number of different armed groups that were vying for territorial control. If you go back, I'll just say like next slide, sorry. Um, so in the late 1980s to early 2000s, there was um, a lot of on-site violence and following a series of uh, state-sponsored military raids um, a new mayoral administration in the early 2000s came in and did an inter urban design intervention. And that is really the sort of focus of uh, my particular research. So um, going into the sort of theoretical framework of where I am um, sort of positioning my arguments, I am drawing from a lot of um, Colombian planning practice um, and scholars working in um, both public space culture as well as policy. And so you see on the left here, I'm um, first considering Rachel Burney's work on public space in Bogota. Um, her studies really highlight the contradictions between um, both the design intent of public spaces, the sort of equity and access components, um, and then the sort of uh, contradictory uh, condition of the surveilling and policing of these spaces um, to sort of enforce these more desirable uh, social behaviors. Um, in the center here, we have Sotomayor who um, investigated some of the different policy strategies that have been employed um, by the Colombian state, um, specifically in the district of San Javier and Medellin, um, and the sort of roles of those policies and embedding and perpetuating some of those socioeconomic uh, inequities in the district. And so really these two focus on the deterritorialization of space on behalf of the state, um, whereas my research, I'm really starting to focus more on um, the re-territorialization of these spaces. So um, how the symbolic and deliberate acts of residents in these neighborhoods um, begins to sort of reshape space um, in order for residents to respond to the inequities that have been imposed upon them by the state. So my methodology and research design, um, it stems from about a year long research endeavor, including about three months um, of consistent field research with several periodic trips back and forth um, during the uh, summer of 2017. Um, this was a very mixed methods research design. So it was leveraging a lot of qualitative and quantitative methods. 
Um, essentially, uh, the first order of magnitude was to gather a lot of site documentation and measurement, um, making sure that I had all the sort of mapping and spatial information that I needed. And then um, a lot of mental mapping. So you see kind of drawing here, uh, the lack of data was just kind of trying to draw reference images. And then what you see to the left here is some of my public space observations, which occurred over roughly two weeks during the um, period where I spent all day sitting in these different public spaces and using a self-developed uh, sort of coding system for identifying um, sort of rough age ranges, demographics, and directional movements. Um, so people were going up or down, side to side, um, lingering in spaces um, to sort of pull different uh, data sets for these public spaces and get a sense of their identity. The public escalators in Las Independencias replaced the steep, narrow stairway. Um, the stairway was about 300 feet um, or 300 steps rising extremely rapidly up the hillside um, in the heart of this neighborhood from a more sort of traditionally uh, subdeveloped neighborhood called Bente de Julio at the bottom of the hillside. Um, the state's intervention through the public escalator system was sort of deterritorialization of this existing stairway, um, which had been the site of so much uh, prior conflict. And so in this way, um, the escalator system was conceived not only as a place for platforms of encounter between the different residents, but also as a link back to the state. And so what you see here in the system is essentially six escalator segments, which are connecting seven um, sort of uh, platforms between where uh, residents tend to gather, sell goods um, and encounter one another. And uh, they're anchored at the bottom by a sort of educational learning center and um, to the north or to the, to the upper part of this diagram, a um, sort of control operations center, community center along a hillside viaduct, which transversely connects some of the adjacent neighborhoods. So this article really starts to document how residents um, use physical occupation, their sort of histories and identities and culture to re-territorialize the public spaces um, within the community. Effectively, these all are really working to generate local economy, um, but also to promote collective healing and community building after so many years of um, generational violence in the community. Um, I've documented uh, sort of over the, the time of occupation, these sort of symbolic acts of, um, you know, hanging laundry or, or putting planters out in public spaces to kind of claim them very um, quietly on their own. Um, but also through uh, graffiti and other neighborhood stories and histories, which um, sort of uh, you know, remain in the space and, and contain layers of messages. Um, you also see in the images here um, some of the tour groups and other informal vending activities which take place along the corridor. Um, and uh, there is a major focus um, from my research of engaging with some of these um, leaders in interviews to get their perspectives on how the community um, had changed from prior years and how these different economic activities were a means of bringing um, by way of uh, this urban design intervention, a new sort of informal um, sector that basically allowed them to create economy in place rather than relying on uh, sort of distant uh, central business district to make their incomes. So the conclusions, I think, are um, continually ever evolving um, as, as I continue to keep in touch with the um, residents in the community. But um, as a story that's really focused around um, the actions and day-to-day -day lived experiences of residents, um, it became increasingly clear that the role of women in Las Independencias has been um, critical to not only um, embracing and sort of giving life to public spaces, but also to the sort of organizing and economic development of the community. Um, these, these acts, which really became as these sort of either subtle or very passive acts, um, have led to a movement where, you know, bricks and mortar restaurants and other, um, you know, larger scale uh, redevelopment has happened from the grassroots level. And so through this community uh, re-territorialization of spaces, um, residents have been able to best position themselves to meet their own needs. Um, we also see as an unintended consequence of some of these urban design interventions that 
Um, women not only have sort of led the charge of re-territorialization in these um, public spaces, but have also received the brunt of um, some of the uh, sort of disruptions in the crime uh, geographies within the neighborhood as now there is such a sort of highly traversed um, neighborhood hub or neighborhood artery, um, much crime has moved into the domestic sphere as well as into um, sort of uh, extortion and other um, more sort of less visible crime, um, crime impacts. And so women have really received uh, you know, not only the obstacles of, um, you know, kind of carrying the community forward from an organizing perspective, but also, um, you know, experiencing some of those uh, unintended consequences more in their in their own homes. So um, I think that's, you know, kind of the, the high level uh, hit. Um, there's a ton more I'd love to, to talk through, but um, I'd just like to like thank everybody again. And on the next slide, I've got um, my contact information if people do want to follow up afterwards. Um, so that's, uh, that's the, the quick and dirty overview. Thank you, Evan. That was, that was great. Um, just wanted to see if any questions at this time. I had a quick one. Um, thanks, Evan, for the talk. I, I really liked it. Um, I had never thought of escalators as a transportation mode before your talk. Um, I'm curious what, it seems like having an escalator would present pretty substantial um, operational and maintenance issues. And I know this isn't directly related to the topic of, of your talk, but this is what came up for me. Is that is that something that happens often? Like, is the escalator breaking down? Does it need to be repaired? Um, how consistent is the escalator service? Um, how consistently is it available? Yeah, so the escalator service um, is typically open, like, kind of roughly business hours. So like a like a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. sort of time frame. Um, there was one particular escalator which was down for maintenance, I think the majority of the time that I was there. Um, but typically they try to prioritize at least one escalator in one direction going up. Um, so if people do need to go down, they can either take the sort of back around through the neighborhood way or take the stairs down. Um, maintenance is definitely a piece that uh, I think is is emblematic of a lot of these social urbanism, uh, urban design interventions is um, there was a period of time where there was uh, maintenance funds sort of baked into the overall sort of ticket price of some of these interventions. And that has largely shifted to, um, you know, flashier, flashier projects um, without any sort of um, revolving maintenance funds or considerations of, of how operationally moving forward those are um, funded and also staffed. Um, I would also note as a part of, you know, the installation of these escalators, I think um, what it sort of manages to take away is that you, um, you force movement. Um, and so it's sort of counterintuitive that you're saying that this is meant to be a space of um, occupation and encounter, but you're simultaneously forcing people on a moving walkway um, to, to sort of push them up or down this hill. And so I think there's a sort of contradiction there within itself as well. Thank you, uh, Dr. Odin. What do you got for me, Odin? Uh, yeah, um, I, just from your images, Evan, um, it seemed like this was a, you know, an older, more mature settlement had gone through upgrading. It seems just again from your images that there was, you know, a relatively robust infrastructure. You know, I saw, you know, electric uh, service lines. And so I guess my question is, do you think the decision to invest in this project was related to the kind of more stable status of these communities? Uh, you know, maybe I'm wrong about just images seem like this was a pretty upgraded, you know, more sort of developed, maybe it started out as an informal settlement, but it was more mature. So do you think government would have in invested in this if the settlement was, you know, 
uh, at a kind of earlier stage? It's a good, it's a good question. Um, so there, there's a fairly robust policy section of my article that starts to kind of go through and, and describe some of the different um, interventions that began in the 80s and even before on sort of informal upgrading. And um, San Javier was a recipient of some of those um, formalization strategies. So that's the electrification, the um, city water, um, you know, improved infrastructure in terms of stairways and, and alleyways. Um, and it certainly is not of the poorest communities um, within the, the city of Medellin. So um, I think what made it a politically salient place to invest was um, sort of following the strong arm um, leadership of Uribe in the early 2000s and the sort of failed uh, disarray that those interventions um, caused. I think it was it was really coming from a place of a more sort of progressive mayoralship um, in the spirit of Medellin to be a little bit more antagonistic towards the state um, to kind of do the equal and opposite. And so uh, San Javier was notorious for its violence and crime and it was kind of an eyesore on the community. And so I think the way that, um, you know, Colombian politicians frame this was, you know, in lieu of the extreme violence that the, the far right was perpetuating, let's take a more humanistic um, and, and centered uh, urban design and planning strategy to really bring people back into the process rather than um, kind of forcing them into that. So I think that's really where the, you know, editorially, I think that's kind of where the, where the impetus for this came from. Um, but there are, are plenty of other examples and other communities which are much more um, much more remote or much less integrated within the, um, within the city um, that also received um, support. And I would say that the distinguishing factors for some of those communities are, um, they are traditionally Antiochian. So they're from the, the state um, and they're more sort of white rural, um, you know, community members, not Atlantic, you know, black Afro-Colombian um, immigrants like much of the independentious community and adjacent communities, um, which are majority Afro. Um, so there's, you know, there's layers of race, there's layers of, uh, you know, perceptions that are, they're playing into those investments for sure. All right, thank you. Um, we'll move on to the next uh, speaker. So hygiene. Yeah, so our three, uh, third speaker is Ankeru um, As Asondichi, uh, who is an urban planner and a lecturer at the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, University of Nigeria. Her research interests includes informal economy, pro-poor planning, and urban rural studies. This publication is part of her PhD dissertation. So Ankeru, the floor is yours. Oh, I'm sorry, I think we can't hear you. No. I think the voice had uh, fixed it before, but I think it's not working anymore. What we can do is maybe we can come back to you. Um, yeah, because there's no there's no sound right now. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, that works. Is it okay? All right. Yes. Okay, my, my work is on starring the treasures and trauma in home-based enterprises towards a rethink by urban planners. First of all, I want to start by saying that a rapid urbanization is... Uh, 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 current occurrence in global south cities and the rapid urbanization of global south cities has actually led to a high rate of unemployment, especially in African cities. And this high rate of unemployment has also led to uh, many people or many urban residents resorting 
to informal employment. Uh, the study nation is Nigeria. Nigeria has, of course, as the most populous nation in Africa, it has a very high rate of unemployment and then uh, has a high rate of informal economy. And Nigeria's informal economy is predominantly home-based. Uh, so home-based enterprises are the focus of this study. Now, the problem of the study from literature, it shows that uh, there's a glaring importance of home-based enterprises, uh, some in terms of economic contributions, social contributions, but also many uh, professionals in the environmental discipline view informal, view informal economy or informal economy activities especially home-based enterprise as you know, a negative phenomenon. They view it as land use distortion, uh, not considering the uh, positive aspects of it. So this uh, view of its importance and its uh, negative perception has actually led to what the mayor uh, calls confusion of what a uh, home-based enterprise actually entails. And so this study is focused on uh, looking at the main, uh, looking at actually the uh, constituents of home-based enterprise with a view, okay, with a view to actually getting uh, the values, the content, the nature, the impact, you know, uh, vividly presented. So the, the study, adopts an objective uh, perspective of, you know, ensuring that the rating is done by not just the home-based enterprise operators, but all the residents within the study area, both home-based enterprise operators and non-operators. The goal actually is to uh, explore the impacts the nature and the impact of home-based enterprise uh, with the aim of presenting a comprehensive view of this phenomenon so that it wouldn't be just uh, the positive aspect or the negative aspect, but a holistic view of what home-based enterprise is all about. So but for this journal, uh, for the article, three objectives were uh, targeted that is to explain or to explore the nature of home-based enterprise in the study area, to explore the positive aspects of home-based enterprise, which is uh, called the treasures, and then the negative aspect, which is the trauma. Uh, for literature, I, I will go, prefer to go to the other aspects of literature. This aspect talks about the Nigeria's uh, statistics, which I will talk about later. Okay. So the, in terms of the nature of home-based enterprise, there are actually a uh, global north perspective and then the global south uh, type of home-based enterprise. The global north home-based enterprises based on literature uh, shows that many home-based enterprises in the global north are registered unlike what is obtained in the global south cities where the home-based enterprises are registered, they are informal and they are mainly survivalist businesses. Now for the economic uh, impacts of home-based enterprises, there are more positive impacts or effects of home-based enterprises based on literature. Uh, some of them include uh, saves the households from despondency. Many poor urban residents actually resort to home-based enterprises because uh, this, they cannot afford to pay the rent for, other, for their businesses or livelihoods in the commercial or industrial areas of the city. And so they use their homes, which is the most valuable resource to them, to carry out you know, their livelihood activities. Also, another positive aspect of a home-based enterprise is the fungibility 
of the resources. Uh, when I talk about the fungibility, I mean, the resources can easily be interchanged. The home, the infrastructure in the home can also be used for business. So for the urban poor residents, this actually saved them a lot of uh, income uh, to save them a lot of income, you know, in terms of uh, affordability. Maybe because of time, I could just move on to the next slide. The uh, social impact of home-based enterprise also has more positive impacts than the negative impacts, especially flexibility of work schedule. And then especially for women that are involved in home-based enterprises, these women, uh, it's of much benefit to them because in Africa and Nigeria in particular, women uh, have that responsibility or ascribe the responsibility of taking care of you know, the sick, the children at home. And so many women don't have the opportunity of actually doing what they really wish to do. So instead of just uh, being at home and uh, taking care of just uh, productive, their reproductive roles, many of them opt for home-based enterprises in order to have a source of income so that they can also contribute to the family's economy. Then for the special impacts of home-based enterprises, uh, there are more negative impacts than the positive impacts. Uh, from literature, it shows that many uh, home-based enterprises have negative effects on housing. It leads to substandard housing, uh, leads to incompatible land uses, and then indiscriminate use of uh, accessible spaces. Although it has the positive impact of providing what uh, we call invented spaces, that is trying to use the spaces, you know, in creative ways to ensure that they accomplish the livelihood source and also have a good place of residence. Now, yeah, the relationship between home-based enterprises and the urban planning in Global South. Uh, I would say that, first of all, the operators experience hostility from urban planners, operators of home-based enterprises. Uh, I experience a, a number of, uh, a lot of hostility from urban planners. Many government policies don't really consider home-based enterprises. And then there's also non-inclusion of these working poor in planning. And uh, another aspect is that home-based enterprises were characteristic of informal settlements. Sometimes we call them slum areas, but uh, recently, currently, it's now becoming a, a characteristic of formal and planned neighborhoods. It has spread from the low, from the high density neighborhoods medium and currently many low density neighborhoods that's where the rich live uh, many home-based enterprises are also found in such locations then the methodology of the work the first uh, residential neighborhoods were sampled for this study where uh, the reason for the four residential neighborhoods which was uh, selected to stratified random sampling was because I uh, wanted to see the incidence of home-based enterprise uh, in every uh, strata of the neighborhood, that is in the informal settlement, in the low density, medium density, and then high density settlement. So one neighborhood from each of these uh, stratum was selected for the study. Then data was collected using uh, two sets of questionnaires, and then the, the a residents within the neighborhoods where we have to rate the impact of home-based enterprises. And these impacts of home-based enterprises that were rated were analyzed using principal component analysis in order to get an objective uh, view. Okay, the results and findings. First of all, in terms of uh, the nature of home-based enterprises, the study found that there were more female home-based enterprise operators than the males. 
which is uh, concurrent with what we find in literature, many literature in Global South uh, on home-based enterprises. And then the age range of the operators is between 16 and 45 years. And many of them educationally hold a senior secondary school certificate as their highest degree. Then in terms of the incidence of home-based enterprises, the informal settlement, which is uh, Obed Camp, had 45% uh, incidence of home-based enterprise. Wani, which is um, a high density area, had 78.4%. New Haven, which is a medium density area, had 75.2%. And then Independence Day Out, which is a low density area, had 60.7%. Uh, this uh, data reveals that home-based enterprises has actually spread to every density. And apart from spreading to every density, even the low density where it's least expected, it's as high as 60% in such areas. Then the treasure, that is the positive aspect of home-based enterprises. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have four out of the five uh, components. We have employment benefits, government revenue, and social improvement, and then economic improvement. And finally, the problems of home-based enterprise negative aspect was embodied actually in one of the factors, which is neighborhood distortion. I earlier mentioned that a uh, special aspect is uh, negative impact are higher in special uh, spheres of home-based enterprise. The conclusion. Uh, the conclusion shows that uh, there is high rate of high rating of the treasures of home-based enterprises by the residents within the neighborhoods. And then the spread of home-based enterprises is a critical signal to urban planners who usually ignore this uh, uh, phenomenon. And then uh, recommendation is there's need for integration of these home-based enterprises into you know, planning schemes in neighborhoods to accommodate uh, the, uh, the operators and also to ensure sustainable development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nkiro. Um, any questions at this time? Yes, Jonathan. Yeah, I was wondering, um... I guess if you could talk a little more about kind of the, the placemaking and the community aspect and how that changed with more home-based enterprises, because, you know, the home is more like a very intimate space and like I can see a communal aspect coming from that, but I can also see kind of a degradation of that if people are not all going to the same place for their services and running into each other and um saying hi and whatnot. So I guess like, was there, like how does this increase in home-based enterprises kind of affect the communal aspect of the neighborhood? Could I get a question once more? I, my audio is uh, a bit low. I, I didn't get the question, please. Yeah, um, I was just wondering like how, how it has, how home-based enterprises have changed like kind of the community fabric of the neighborhood and and like the integrations between people um in terms of like whether how often they see each other and stuff like that sorry Kira, we can't hear you No, nothing yet, sorry. No. Would it be possible for you to maybe um, respond in the chat? Okay. okay. Uh, can I get the question in the chat? I couldn't, I didn't hear him very well because of the audio, please. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Thanks okay, a lot, thank John. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, let's move on to the next speaker, Mickey Edwards. He is a PhD and 
and is currently a visiting researcher at the University of Illinois Springfield, where he studies motor vehicle crashes and their effect on pedestrians, cyclists, and communities. His other interests include transportation and inf infrastructure equity. He has worked on policy in the US Senate and taught several courses at the University of Cincinnati. His previous in careers include several years in photojournalism and the staying as an engineer for a large consumer goods company. <clears throat> Mickey, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So yes, um, I do work for the University of Illinois at Springfield, uh, but because of cool technology, I'm actually sitting in uh, what is now rainy Carmel, Indiana. So. If you follow transportation planning, you know that Carmel, Indiana has like <laughs> the most um, uh, roundabouts, I think, in the country. Um, so it's an interesting place to be to study, um, to be studying transportation. So again, my name is Mickey Edwards, and my article is titled 12th Ride, a Saturday Morning Driving for um, Uber in Cincinnati. Let me also start by saying that uh, these presentations have been phenomenal. <laughs> uh, so I'll be brief because I feel like mine was an exploration. So doesn't have the academic rigor some of the other uh, presenters brought to this. Um, so it's a little, a little um, embarrassing actually that my, uh, uh, my academic uh, or my presentation isn't as, isn't as, well, in my opinion, as good. So if you back up the slide to the title page, actually, <clears throat> this is, what you see here is a, uh, a scene from a Shakespearean play, Twelfth, uh, Twelfth Night, which uh, has nothing to do with Uber uh, or ride hailing, but my experience, I did give 12 rides, so there's that that uh, coincidence, but my experience driving for Uber um, that morning, and it was actually for Uber um, in particular, and we can get into that later if someone has a question as to why it was Uber uh, and not Lyft. But uh, so it was driving for Uber, and my experience was kind of uh, reminded me a bit of uh, the uh, tragic comedy of, uh, of Twelfth Night. So um, that was inspiration for, uh, for the title and for my uh, introduction uh, slide there. So uh, next slide. Uh, so I, I want to talk a little bit about sort of getting to the, the details of the, of the paper and, and the findings. Uh, I mean, it's there for anyone who's curious and they, they, they welcome to read it, please do. I want to talk more about like the background, like the background noise that, uh, that, that I couldn't write about in the, in the paper. So uh, why did I write this? Well, I wrote it basically out of necessity. Um, at the time, uh, a few years ago, um, I was midway through my, my PhD, my doctoral program, <clears throat> I was wrapping up my uh, my, my studies, my classroom studies, and uh, diving into uh, the research portion. And at the time, I don't have four children, but at the time I had two, and they were aged two and under. And um, my funding had run out after two years, and really, I needed the money. So I was driving for uh, Uber and Lyft in Cincinnati uh, while I was studying at the University of Cincinnati, um, just because I, I had to. Um, and then <laughs> somewhat, it, it occurred to me slowly that, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm basically doing field research because my dissertation was on ride hail equity. You know, who's right, who takes ride hail, uh, where, they, where they take it to, where they use it for, what role does it play in, in communities? So I thought, well, geez, I'm, I'm doing this uh, to, to turn money, but I'm also doing field research. So I might as well try to get a, a paper um, out of this as well, because you're only, you know, in, in academia, you either you know, publish or perish, and the more the better. So I thought, well, I can maybe um, do two things at once here. Um, uh, next slide I should say curiosity. So, so that was the impetus for it. That was what I was doing out of necessity. I thought I might as well just get a paper out of this. I was also curious while I was doing the, the research of Red Hill Equity. Um, this is a few years ago, and if anyone's familiar with the Red Hill um, literature, it's come a long way in the past few years. There's excellent articles out there now, and excellent researchers doing excellent work. But at the time, the kind of the nascent the literature. Um, was, was, I was reading, didn't really square with what I was seeing um, in, in Cincinnati while, while I was driving. Um, a lot of the research was still saying, you know, this is primarily, you know, drunk college kids getting to and from bars, which there's still definitely that happening, but I was seeing much more, um, much more nuanced uses, people using it to do all, all different kinds of things, um, anything that you would use a bus or, or a car or, or to walk to do. So just curious, like, okay, what would happen if I, if I just picked a morning and took like a non um, you know, statistically significant cross section of, of the people in Cincinnati using Ride Hill and study it 
and then compare that, what I saw, to what I'm reading um, in the literature. So I was curious, like how, how that would um, how that would match. Uh, so that's that's what I that's what I did. Uh, and the next the next slide, please, is um, I'm, I'm into minimalism. If you can't tell, so the folks, so the the people that I met and I wanted to um, to talk about because in, again, in the, in the literature that in these that we're still reading. In this in this field, um, tends to put people in buckets. You know, they meet this demographic, this socioeconomic you know, statistic. They're you know, the rich, they're poor, they're black, they're white, they're Hispanic. I went into a little bit more detail about you know the more finer detail. But I think it's called messy details. And there's some messy human details of why people um, use um, right hill, at least from what I was experiencing in Cincinnati. And I wanted to put. Uh, I, would, I couldn't put all the details in I wanted to. I mean, first, for to protect the anonymity of, of the writers, you don't want to give anything away, and also just to keep um, just to keep it clean, basically. But you know, um, the what I experienced was and it's in an article, people just using Red Hill either because they you know, a lot of them had to. They've been a one woman um, who I gave a write to that morning who was in, in the article uh, works for a nonprofit and. She left her car parked in the gated parking lot over the, over one weekend, and she returned on a Sunday or Monday, and her car had been stripped, and she found it on blocks, and um, she couldn't afford another car, so she sold the what was left for scraps, and now she's had to take um, kind of use ride heel to get to and from work, which is um, you know much more um, expensive um, proposition. Other people, um, uh, like I, I mentioned also in the article, um, one man. Had to pick up a child, a dependent child from from, from childcare someplace, and um, you know this is an interesting thing that puts drivers in, in, in strange positions, uh, and myself included. And again, I didn't want to put this in the paper because I don't want it to be um, publicly out there. But uh, here I am. Uh, the child. The, oftentimes, people get into your car uh, without um, any sort of child seat. No child restraints whatsoever. They, they, they just get in, and this was, I think, a three or maybe four year old from what I could tell. And they, and they just get in, and you're driving around with, uh, you know, an unbelted adult and an unbelted um, child in the, in the back of the car, which um, I think is something that um, I don't think many people think about. And I've never really seen that that detail um, put put out there. Um, and I will say too, this is all just observational. I just had to uh, guess on. Um, you know, people's ages and other, other types of um, identities. And I'm probably wrong in most cases, but um, again, it's not statistically significant. I, I was really center for the details. Uh, and the final slide, um, I wanted to show this. This is also um, online in the article. This was a screenshot I took from the driver's perspective um, from a, a um, this is a different morning than the morning of the observation, but uh, this is what, at least at the time when I was driving, uh, the driver would see, um, and they had they have about five seconds to make a decision. So Uber presents the driver with all these different um, statistics about what the potential ride will be, and you have to make a decision. So in this particular case, um, you see my, my location um, was, and this is like in greater Cincinnati, was the, in the lower uh, right, there's a, a circle with a blue arrow, that was my location. And the re request is coming in the top left, um, where the, the, the blue pin with this uh, white square. So this is where, this is what they I was presented with. And they, they tell me a little bit of information about, about the trip request. They say it's an Uber action. So that's what I was driving for. If you don't know, that is their uh, Uber's uh, kind of like introductory, um, like base model, baseline. Um, at the time, it was the cheapest. You know, they have Uber uh, pool and that sort of thing. But anyway, so that's what, what type of uh, trip they're, they are requesting. And in the middle there, they have like a white bust uh, of a, a person. And I never saw it in the Uber application, but in the Lyft application, um, when I was driving, every once in a while you would see a profile uh, picture of the person requesting the ride. I never saw that in UberX. And I, I suspect that it was because, um, and my research shows this as well, they're trying to protect the anonymity of the, of the passenger or the rider um, from any bias that the driver may have. Maybe they don't like the age or the gender of the person requesting. So it's almost completely anonymous from the driver's perspective. The driver does have one little bit of information just to the right of the bus there. You see five stars, you see star in the five. So I know that this drive, this rider 
uh, that's be okay. Other drivers have rated this person five stars, so they have a five star average. So that's uh, a little bit of um, information there that the, the driver has. And some drivers are actually um, decline trip requests from people who have like less than a 4.8 uh, star rating. There's actually been um, SNL Saturday Night Live skits about this. Um, but also, more importantly, for the, from the driver's perspective, um, which writers may not realize is, so it's telling me that now it will take me 19 minutes to get from where I'm at now to pick up that, that passenger. Um, and that's, that's always a minimum. It's not like an average or like what it might, it might take, like an average trip time. So, so I, I could expect probably 25 minutes, 25 minute drive, and about 12 and a half miles. And depending on what kind of MPGs I'm getting, that could be a, a gallon of gasoline. So it's already cost me $3 in gas just to get there uh, to pick up the passenger. And many drivers, myself included, have been burned once on trips like this. So you, so you drive up there, and you pick the passenger up, and then it's a minimum fare ride. And it's no fault of the passenger. But if, if as a driver, you know, minimum fare ride at the time was paying $3 or something like that. So as a driver, I'm already kind of uh, you know, losing at this game. So um, they also finally, they, they try to tease you there at the bottom, so it's pick up premium likely. Um, so they try to tease you, like, we make even more money, but typically they never do. Um, so, Anyway, I just wanted to share, share a little bit of the, the driver's perspective of um, what um, the, the background that um, I couldn't put in the paper <laughs> uh, of what um, the impetus for this work and my experience doing it. So thank you. Thank you. That was definitely a very different uh, sort of approach, but really cool. Um, any questions? I have, a, I have a quick one. So um, I appreciate you kind of going over these details that you didn't want to include in the paper. There provides a lot of um, helpful kind of color and nuance um, that you wouldn't normally see. But I'm curious, maybe you could just share um, quickly what some of the high level findings were from the work, like in general, what types of people were you picking up? What types of trips were they making? And how did those um, observations that you were making as a driver differ from what you were seeing in the literature? Yeah, that's good. That's good. I should have um, included that. Um, so thank you for asking that. So yeah, it was, um, again, the, when I first had the idea for this, this paper, um, what I was seeing was, was different. It was, see, the, it was um, there's one paper in particular, it's a famous one that came out really early that stated, you know, um, almost everyone they picked up are, you know, um, young millennials going to going to party or doing social social trips. Um, but again, as, as by the time this got published, um, the literature has changed and caught up to what I was seeing. So what I, what I did see um, of those 12 trips, I forget the exact numbers. Um, most of them, most of the trips were for what I call functional purposes. So they were people just trying to run, like pick up your my child from, from childcare. Uh, a lot of people use it, uh, use it to get to work. Um, or go to, you just go to like a friend's house. I guess that would be a social purpose as well. And there was a handful of the, the stereotypical, you know, uh, take me back to, to the bar where I was, I was too intoxicated to drive home last night, or I said, I said at, a, at, a, um, at a friend's house. So it did, uh, depending on which literature you, you were reading, it, it kind of, it did kind of confirm for me, like, okay. And I was also doing simultaneously doing research on a data set that I actually had from um, Red Austin there in Austin, Texas. I was also confirming the research that I was doing independently outside of the, the published literature that I was finding that you know more and more um, there is a diverse, a racially, ethnically, socioeconomically diverse um, a set of people who are using ride hail um, and services for pretty much anything and everything that that you would use a car for. Um, but from work, from work was work was definitely um, um, not just in this day, but also on my other experiences. Work getting to work or home from work was was um, a, a big one. At least when I was driving. Again, this is hard. This is why I, I, I kind of opted to do the non statistically significant way here because it's really difficult um, to get a representative sample if you're not driving 24 hours a day just because of the time of day. Like if I were to drive at you know, 11 o'clock on a Saturday, I probably would have gotten a much different, it probably would have involved in people coming home from bars and restaurants. So it would have been a much different, um, different experience. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Moving on to the next presentation. Okay, our last presentation is a photo essay. 
that will be presented by Gabriel Espinoza, who is a sociologist and anthropologist currently enrolled in the PhD program in geography at West Virginia University. His work has a cultural geography emphasis addressing questions about late liberalism, value and dispossession. His areas of study has been linked to Latin American ruins and process of re-commodification and design in household economies. Let's welcome Gabriel. Uh, thanks. Um, I'm glad that most of the presentations today were linked to informality. So I fit pretty well to the major topics discussed today. And my presentation is a little bit messy. So I mean the slides. So I will say like next slide or in the case of my commentaries. So I will stop in that slide and I want to introduce the main goal of my presentation, which is to discuss how abandonment is a biased concept within the governance of urban properties and land. Um, next one. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce Santiago, where my research takes place, uh, as a deregulated city due to the urban policy which ruled the land uses since nine, 1979. Uh, which have deployed major reaches in the extension of urban land because of the old regulation in land uses, uh, which reinforce a competition for private investment between communes in order to have funding. So communes are the geographical unit that use the city. In, uh, in the previous, next one, please. Uh, this deregulation can be shown in the graphic in this graphic of the urban expansion of Santiago since 1992, which is, is most of the expansion of this urban extension is private investors, um, tiny like projects, which are part of a non-central activity of expansion of producing the city. Uh, next one, please. So in this context, my research focuses in abandon in an abandoned industrial building, which is waiting for some investment to take it over and bring it back to be used and to produce value. Uh, the building, which, uh, which is my case of study, was one both uh, urban architectural milestone as well as an agent of modernization for reinforcing the local industry. And this building held a factory since it built in 1940s continuously to the late 1990s. And so then it has been abandoned. And in the early 2000s, it was acquired by a real estate agency but from 2002 or three to 2019, it didn't have any specific use. Uh, next one, please. Yes, this is the part of the inside of the building during the period of abandonment that went from early 2000 until uh, 2019. Uh, then, so uh, my research discusses the concept of abandonment by exploring the location of the building by with ethnographic methods and a theoretical framework that helps me to dispute the concept of abandonment is the idea that buildings are procedural objects. As Michael Guggenheim uh, points out, these are mutable immobile. They are topographically fixed to the soil, but constantly in social and material rearticulations. Uh, so, and next one, please. Uh, in this slide, I like explain most of my thesis and I go almost to the conclusions. Uh, so, regarding the Senate's building, I suppose three events that defines and open the discussion about what is abandonment and how it is created. First of all, abandonment is a concept that comes when something is hard to grasp, uh, when the identity of a place hasn't been fixed as something of constant use or reference. The building is there and might have some activities in the facade or by individuals in the inside, but it's not being used as one thing only. Also, the latest, light, the latest unified identity that it had, the building, was a factory and was publicly known as such. However, once it ceased its, its industrial, industrial activity, the building became many things. As the number of activities it held, the 
has during the period of 2000, early 2000 to late 2010s. It held a Lucha Libre or wrestling training and shows, uh, airsoft matches where people start like, it's pretty much like paintball, but, it, but you don't shoot like paintballs, but plastic balls to each other. Uh, it was occupied as a warehouse, a parking lot, etc. So these activities that weren't acknowledged as uh, occupancy uh, enter in this second concept, which is internet spaces, uh, the, which is a concept pretty useful to uh, analyze this process from abandonment to occupation of uh, urban spaces. Uh, this is some of sorts, this is some sort of management of the void with temporary activities, helping to keep the property unsquatted without informal and undesired users, but neither acknowledging the current users as definitive ones. It's some sort of immediate stage waiting for a major investment to unify the property, hence the identity of it. And finally, the occupation take place uh, in, in the particular case that I studied, uh, powered by private investors, um, the local government. Um, so the, the project, there is an idea of value, uh, something that it's constantly unified and that can also uh, have a public identity, which is different to the interim or the temporary activities that were held in the building between the early 2000 to late 2029. Uh, so the next slide, please. Um, for me, it's very exemplary. Uh, because, as is remarking in yellow, uh, there is a project that was developed inside the building uh, with a little bit of an innovative project in the building of the Santas Institute, which was empty for 20 years. This statement, uh, dated August 5, uh, claimed that all the activities previous to the, this particular project that is powered and uh, patronized by the municipal, by the local government, uh, by private investor, uh, are not even considered as, as right or, or even acknowledged. So there is an idea that also the recuperation of the building is a process that will help the community and at the same time obliterate other type of informal activities. And in the next slide, Please, um, we are done with this. Uh, this is the transformation of the building. And the next one show how the building became an art gallery, a uh, craft beer brewery, a deli shop, pickle uh, jar bars, uh, bringing back the building to activities through uh, a gentrification agenda that was held by private investors and the local government. So that's my presentation. Thank you so much. Um, questions for Gabrielle? I have one. Um, so we're, uh, thanks for the presentation. In your work, um, were there alternative visions for the use of this building put forward by folks who actually lived in the community or were they articulating some kind of different um, visions of urban development that were uh, in contrast to or conflicting with those that were, the one that you just shared um, that was kind of being pushed by the state um, and how were there any, was there any kind of struggle around that? How did that kind of play out? I mean, um, I will try to respond to this because I've been installing this building in a neighborhood since 2017, 18, and I still keep on this research uh, because it's part of framing in a major research about urban ruins in Latin America, uh, which includes Colombia, Ecuador, and Santiago, and Chile. And no, there, there wasn't like a, a contested production of the space because Santiago is so liberalized, liberalized like unregulated, that these guys bought the building in the early 2000s, and that was it. I mean, there's nothing that you can do if you have the money to, to contest the property in, in, the, in 
in, in a property level, you know? And, and well, and there is like some type of trend in Santiago that everything is going into process of gentrification. So there is not two voices uh, about the consequences of it. I mean, in low income, because the other thing is that this building is placed in a low income working class uh, commercial area. Um, not only this building, there, there has been some major like shapes of uh, other buildings around. So it's it's pretty much a, a trend that it's has been led by the local government, uh, busting this place with a lot of like wealthy professionals, middle high income users. So uh, I think more issues about this situation will be seen in 10 to five years because it only took place like since 2015, this type of investment had taken place in this. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to say if there's any other questions, so you know we're, we're done with the presentations and thank you to all the participating authors and if we could just send like another clapping emoji <laughs> to them. Um, and I just wanted to sort of say in the last 10 minutes or to eight minutes, you know, if anybody has any questions, follow up questions to the authors or even questions about planning forum. And if you would like to participate or be a part of planning forum as a board member or anything like that, please don't. This is your chance to ask. Yeah. Sorry, Matthew, just you're a little bit, I can't hear you. That's a good, that's a good check for folks. Yeah. Still can't hear you fully. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Is that better? Yes, that's perfect. Yeah. Am I, uh... My microphone was set to a speaker out in the hallway. I don't know how that happened. Sorry about that. Um, Gabriel, thank you for that presentation. I, 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 again, I don't really have like a question per se. I just like a comment. I was very struck by um, the similarities of kind of the story that has happened in Detroit um, with the uh, massive global shifts of the auto industry um, where Detroit was kind of a massive hub of building all these cars there are just warehouses and factories and just massive building after massive building that are completely abandoned now um and it's kind of a, a big story of just the city of detroit just abandonment um and i don't know if you've ever been but it's it would be an interesting place to visit to see a comparison because it's a very similar story of kind of artists and artisans moving in, buying up a, a space and um, building these kind of like little spaces and stores and shops and everything in there. Um, it was just, I, I had visited those and I'm looking at these pictures and I'm like, this just is, is such a similar scene. Um, and that exact same story too, of the process of gentrification through that um, kind of buying up these spaces and, and artists moving in. Um, it's very, just very similar. So I was really struck by that. Yeah, I, I only have seen the situation of Detroit by photos. Um, there is an author, I don't know if you know him, it's called, I can't pronounce it, so I'm gonna write it in the chat, sorry. Uh, which his work uh, about greens in, it's pretty good. And I am sure that in his Last book, the Dead City. He, I don't know, it was sent or not. I know. Sorry, to everyone there. Uh, he talked about Detroit or this this situation from industrial abandonment to a post-industrial era of gentrification. Uh, also happened in Berlin or yeah, in London and in New York during the late seventies and early. 80s. Uh, there is other two authors that I maybe you can check out 
if you want to deepen in this subject. I will recommend Claire Colum, uh, which is a scholar in the UCL Barnett University uh, School. She pretty much is a, a specialist in uh, gentrification after post-industrial periods. And the other is an American book from Sarah Schulman, who is a queer activist. And she has this amazing book called The Gentrification of the Mind, where she like made the whole process of New York as a broken city in the 70s, and then how the white flag came back to the to Manhattan uh, to the boroughs in order to resuscitate them, but actually it was a process of gentrification is led by the global, local government. I think it's a trend, a trend worldwide. And here in South America, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, it's a trend that here in South America, it's pretty new. I mean, in Colombia, you have like Economia Naranja. And it's called like some sort of Latin gentrification. And in Chile, it, it only took it, it's taking place, it has been taking place for the last 10, 10 years, but uh, right now you can see it. And before it was like something you weren't part of, but right now it's everywhere. And um, yeah, industrial leftovers, I think, are the use pie in order to gentrify and, and to recommodificate the city. Thanks. Thank you, Matthew, for that question. Um, any other last comments, questions? Um, I also wanted to sort of say that uh, sh uh, have a sh you know sh shout out to the reviewers. <laughs> a lot of them were actually UT faculty, um, uh, our School of Architecture faculty. I think, and Dr. Carnery. I know you also reviewed one, so thank one or two. Thank you so much to them. And, um, and if you all are interested in publishing with Planning Forum, also reach out to us. Um, the email address should be on the website. Um, and I'll put it here too. Uh, and please do check out the website. Please do support Planning Forum. And please, if you're interested in being part of the board, also reach out to us. Thank you so much. <laughs>